Awesome, Angelica. Yay, we have quorum. Okay, let's get started. Sorry, I had a difficult, I had some difficulty. Um, I don't know what happened there. I also searched for the Zoom link as in the instructions, but it was not in my email. So don't know. Yeah. Sorry. Dan, no, it's all right, Dan. I'm glad you're here. Danica's going to be sending it out because maybe some other commissioners are stuck too. Um, all right, let's begin and call the order of the day. Danica, can you take roll? I certainly can. So we're going to start off with Chair Wendy. I am here. Fabulous. Vice Chair Magania. Present. Wonderful. Commissioner Zisser. Present. Great. Commissioner Rem Takar. Absent. Commissioner Thorson. Present. Thank you. Uh, let's see. Commissioner Mendoza. Present. Thank you. Commissioner Kelly. Can I sit right here? <laughs> Great. Commissioner Jolly. I am here. Yay. Wonderful. Commissioner Ramos. Present. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Allen. Moving on, Commissioner Melillo. All right, all roll being called, you have a quorum. Got it, thank you. Okay, we're gonna move to the consent calendar. We, um, in our consent calendar is to approve today's uh, October 20th agenda and the minutes, I think we, I was um, not at one of these and we didn't have quorum. So we have two uh, regular meeting minutes that are in the consent calendar. Does anyone want to pull any of it for um, discussion? Okay, hearing none, can I have a first on uh, approving the consent calendar? I, I, <clears throat> I move to approve it. Thank you, Commissioner Kelly. Can I have a second? Commissioner Jolly seconds. Thank you, Commissioner Jolly. Everybody who approves say aye. 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 Anybody opposed? Any abstentions? All right, it's approved. Moving on. There is no public record still, Danica? Still. Okay, no public record today or no public correspondence. Is there anybody here to give um, comments two minutes in open forum? No, Danica, nobody in there. I don't see any hand raised. We do have one attendee. So two, mm -hmm. <laughs> to our lovely guest, if you would like to make a public comment, please utilize the raise your hand feature and we can call on you. All right, no go, we're moving on. It's gonna be a quick one. In our discussion action items tonight, we have all informational, um, three informational items, nothing needs action, which uh, is great. So the first one is uh, review the bond and audit. The second will be the bond program plan. And the third is a program spotlight on the speech and debate club. So are we ready for the review of the bond and audit question uh, presentation? Uh, Really quick question, well, not a question, but a really quick comment on that. We had three items, but our bond program update or our bond pilot program update has been deferred to January 19th. So I this evening you. we'll have two items, uh, the bond and audit questions, as you said, and then the program, <laughs> stop, the program spotlight. Uh, so just, just in case anyone was really looking forward to that, that previous item, uh, you'll just have to come back in January. <laughs> Thanks for keeping me on track, Danica. No problem. All right, are we ready? Revo review bond and audit questions presentation to engage in a verbal discussion and gather questions for the November Oversight Committee meetings. Andrea. Hi, good evening, everyone. Um, this is Andrea Master, the Administrative Officer for the Library Department. And so just um, quickly as a reminder, you know, uh, this item's uh, agendized here as an informational item um, because we annually um, have an independent audit of both our library bond fund and our library parcel tax fund. 
And as, um, as the Library and Education Commission, you also um, serve as the Library Bond Oversight Committee and the Parcel Tax um, Oversight Committee, which um, will be convening in November. And um, when you convene in November, you will be reviewing um, either draft or, or final audits, depending on when they're, where they are in the process. Um, um, to um, And also the city auditor will be there to answer any questions. And so what we typically do is use um, September and October commission meetings to gather questions from you, engage you in the process, and then um, make sure that we can have those questions answered during the November meeting. Um, by the city auditor. So with that um, being said, I'm going to open the floor to you guys. Does Andrew, anybody have any questions? Since we have some new commissioners, do you happen to have some questions that were asked before so people can kind of get a kind of an overview or an understanding of the types of questions we ask as a commission typically? Yes. So some of the questions um, that have been previously asked, um, some were uh, surrounding around what types of transactions were reviewed during the audit process? Um, what type of sample size did you use during the audit process? Um, what are the accuracy intervals and confidence levels associated with the sample sizes that are being used? Um, what types of records did you use? Um, what time frame was the audit um, covering? And um, let's see here, what other? Um, there were some uh, general questions about Measure O in terms of the bonds that were issued and if, um, and if Measure O was still relevant. Um, and then some questions surrounding restrictions um, in use of bond funds. So Andrea, also do we, I can't, I can't remember, um, but I know you will, that do we ask before uh, questions around what was anything um, found and recommendations from last year given that we have acted upon this year? Yeah, so there was, um, I believe last year during the November meeting, there was a question about that and um, there was no, um, the statement made by the city auditor at that time was that there was no findings in the audit, that the, the audit resulted in good, um, that we used the funds appropriately. Yeah, so if we could just have that same question for me, that would be okay. really helpful. Commissioner Kelly. Yes, thank you. Uh, this is my first meeting, so uh, I Welcome. would probably be asking a good question. On this matter here, was there uh, an independent auditor who was uh, out of the city, out of the library system, and um, uh, uh, as an advisory person to the commission? Andrea, that's you, I think. Who's I'm our sorry. auditor? He's, at, I think you're asking, see if I'm asking it for you, um, and I've got it right, Commissioner Kelly. You're asking basically to explain who is the audit who are the auditors that are auditing, auditing us and what is it for and are they independent or and they give the we are the oversight body is that what you're kind of asking about that is a very good question i'm glad you're asking it <laughs> andrea can you, can you feel that one yeah well it is in um uh, so we can also have our city auditor answer it in november but it um, the requirement specifically states in the municipal code that it is required to be an external audit firm. And so the city auditor does an RFP and uh, contracts with an audit firm. And typically that um, agreement with the audit firm is a multi-year agreement because it's beneficial to have them look at our financial statements over multiple years. So that is, um, it is an external audit. Thank you very much. Anything further, Commissioner Kelly, before I move on? Uh, I, I would make some recommendations, but I'm not going to do it tonight. Okay. How about you, Commissioner Zisser? Yeah, I, I'm, I guess I'm a little bit lost. Um, so can you just back up and explain sort of the process? I mean, has the audit occurred? What's being presented in November? Um, I'm not even clear on why we're suggesting questions right now. So I, I don't really understand um, where, where we're at, I'm sorry. And I don't, I was just looking through my emails to see if we had received any documents. I don't think that we have, I could be mistaken, but 
Yeah. Um, so great questions. Um, so the audit isn't final. So I have um, reviewed draft audits and have gone back and forth with the um, external auditor. And so those are those are still in draft form. Okay. As soon as they are in um, a format where we can provide them to you, which is definitely going to be before the November meeting, um, we will send those over to you. Um, and then the questions. Um, so two things. So one, I, I think um, Danica, maybe correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that the previous year audit links were provided to commissioners. Is that correct, Danica? So I did send the previous audit information to Commissioner Zisser um, on request. So he uh, oh, okay. hopefully was able to review a, a previous audit, but it would not be sort of, I guess, the current audit for lack of a better word, yes. um, simply because as you said, that document is still in a draft form. Right, That's I think that's where I yeah. was confused. I remember receiving something um, and that was so that I could figure out if I wanted to be on the committee, on the ad hoc committee or, um, and so I do have that earlier one, which is also public. I think it's available publicly, right? So, um, so yeah, I, I guess I, yeah. So that makes sense. I understand it's not complete. Um, I wasn't missing anything in that respect. I'm glad to know that. Um, and so, and so you're gonna have the auditor or the auditor will be joining us in November to go through the audit uh, with us. And we'll have a chance then to ask questions about it, uh, presumably. Uh, so um, as to that, what are you soliciting from us right now in terms of questions for the auditor? That That's sort of the remaining point of confusion for me. I'm sorry if I missed something. I just, yeah. I... No, you did not. You're one, uh, of course, Andrea, you, I would love for you to say, but I, from my point of view, a lot, we have, those of us that have been here through multiple of them, this is kind of the warm up, getting ready. What you know, those of us that kind of know, say, okay, so did we have clear findings? That's a kind of a standard question. Did they okay. make it in the time frame? What did the did the pandemic affect any of this? Andrea is another one. Um, like we're just kind of giving some general guidance. Of course, we'll ask specific questions, Commissioner, when we get there. That's just from the chair's perspective. Andrea, please, please, from staff. Yeah, so um, yes, Wendy, that is um, correct. The other um, purpose or intent is if there is something that's more complex and data driven that we give the auditor a heads up and he's able to actually answer that question at the meeting instead of yeah. saying that he has to go back and look into it. And so that's another um, kind of intention of us coming to you early and, and trying to make sure that we can um, we can prepare the city auditor and that he can answer the questions. But of course, once the audit is actually um, issued and you look at the audit and read it, you're definitely going to have questions that you're, you're probably going to ask him the day of the meeting. Uh, I appreciate. It. So that makes that makes perfect sense. It's a great that process makes perfect sense. So thank you for explaining it to me. Of course, of course. We're so happy to have new commissioners and we have to slow down a little bit because we just kind of go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, it, it makes, and Wendy, I appreciate you, uh, you know, bearing with me, but also explaining the process. And you too, Andrew, course, thank sir. you. Please, please stop us along the way. That's super helpful. Others, are there other general, did you catch Andrea, the pandemic? I'm really curious. Yes, I got it. Thank you. Any other folks that are have some general kind of knowing um, or specific, but um, for me, it's always general. It, it seems like every year at this time, questions that we want to get ready for. All right. If not, thank you thank for you. going through it with us and then we'll keep moving. <laughs> okay. So we're moving past B since that's deferred to January to uh, the informational item, I think, video on the speech and debate club. Yeah, welcome. Um, thank you. Um, good evening, commissioners. I'm Vidya Kilambi, Division Manager for Education and Innovation. Um, today, um, I have two wonderful librarians, um, Bridget and Tiffany, who will be presenting on speech and debate for global citizenship. Our volunteer, Catherine, could not be here today, but I'm sure um, our two wonderful librarians will be. Uh, Bridget is from Youth Services, is a librarian at uh, Youth Services, and Tiffany is acting branch manager at Allen Rock Hillview and Mount Pleasant Libraries. So they are here today to present. Go ahead. 
Okay, well, thank you very much uh, for inviting us to present an overview of the Speech and Debate Club uh, Global Citizenship Program, uh, which is at King Library. And we began it in the spring of 2020, and it still continues to the present. We're very proud of that. Uh, my name, of course, is Bridget Kowalczyk, and I am a librarian in youth services and a coordinator of the program. Uh, I have taught oral expression and acting at San Jose State University in the theater department for 10 years. And I've also served as the information literacy specialist for San Jose State University Library, uh, incorporating elements of instructional design and curriculum development into the InfoLit program to ensure quality instruction. Uh, our program consultant, Tiffany Bradford Oldham, uh, as uh, Vidya had mentioned, is uh, acting senior librarian at Three Branches, uh, Alam Rock, Mount Pleasant, and Hillview. And her background in speech and debate and her knowledge of history has been invaluable, uh, a contribution to the program. It ensures our quality standards. Uh, her work with the racial equity team makes her um, role as a consultant really ideal for us as their mission is to create an environment that is welcoming, inclusive for all individuals, brings people together, builds community and enriches lives. It's clearly aligned with the goals of our speech and debate global citizenship program. And lastly, Catherine, who couldn't be with us here today. Catherine Tong is a graduate of Notre Dame High School who was on the speech and debate team there from 2017 to 2021. And she also served as chair of parliamentary debate since May of 2019. Uh, we are very grateful to her for her expertise, her drive and her strong work ethic. Uh, in fact, we were so impressed with her uh, that youth services voted her volunteer of the year two years running. Uh, and uh, we also congratulate her on being accepted into UC Berkeley's global management program in the fall of this year. Uh, this is a highly coveted opportunity as they only accept 1% of their applicants. Next slide. So there's Catherine. Uh, and in the fall of 2019, uh, at that time, I was in charge of the Homer Club at King Library, the in-person Homer Club. And my supervisor, Lizzie Nolan, uh, suggested that I look for ways to continue to improve the program. And I decided that a way to do that was to enhance the social and emotional component of the program by improving the activities we offered once the students completed their homework, because they do remain after their homework is done. So I started thinking about that and I decided to kind of query the, um, all the coaches to find out what skills they had. Uh, and we got a list of them from uh, the coaches. They were, I found a juggler, a knitter, a ukulele player, a coder, uh, all kinds of wonderful skills that we were able to bring to the kids after homework club when they finished their homework. But Catherine says, yeah, I can do speech and debate. And I'm like, Catherine, that is not something you do after school. That's something you do long-term. Uh, so how about you come back to me next spring and bring me a program? And so she worked with her, um, with her supervisor over at Notre Dame, uh, came back with a curriculum that was wonderful. And we started working together and honing the curriculum to make sure it was correct for the, ages, uh, for the grades of three to five. Uh, since then, we've offered four series uh, starting in spring 2020. Uh, with our fifth series launching tomorrow, <laughs> which is pretty exciting. Um, the first series in spring 2020, uh, as you can imagine, uh, since it began in February, it quickly, um, quickly had to morph into being an online program. Uh, so Catherine, truly an amazing individual, uh, managed to completely rethink it and we offered it online. None of the kids wanted to leave the program. Um, we revamped it, we got it on Zoom, and I, took, I think it took about three weeks that we had to kind of prep, and then we were right back and ended up doing the program for about 16 weeks. The kids just didn't want to leave. They loved it. Uh, so we're very proud of that. Uh, and all the subsequent series have been completely online. Okay, next slide. So for the past four semesters, our focus has been on working with third to fifth graders. As this age group typically doesn't have a lot of exposure to speech and debate and critical thinking or diving into difficult topics or dialogues. So we learned in the first series, it wasn't feasible to try to teach them the traditional elements of speech and debate. Because um, first those students need to kind of get the building blocks uh, and the goals of speech and debate before we could get in, them into a more formalized uh, 
form of learning that. And so we've decided that middle schoolers are probably the best age to start learning those skills. Um, our classes included icebreakers at the start, and we do a brief lecture on the topic and work in smaller groups to read and discuss articles. Um, this supported the two goals that we teach that we feel are necessary um, to be successful, which is to work collaboratively and to improve your communication skills so that they can spark critical thinking. Um, we played some games like Would You Rather that challenges them to kind of defend their viewpoints with strong evidence for their choices. And then we take some time to play devil's advocate to strengthen those students' abilities to make sure that they are thinking critically and thinking about how they can best support their arguments. Next slide, please. Um, students work on teams to read articles and identify evidence um, to support those arguments during their final presentations. Um, during the first two semesters, we taught the students how to research debates after brainstorming keywords to locate credible sources. However, when the series had to be shortened in length, we adjusted that and started to ask them questions after they did some popcorn reading in their breakout rooms and help them extract the things that they found in those articles that would serve as their evidence for those final presentations. And then we had the students engage in sparring with their instructors and their instructor assistants to defend those viewpoints and later talk about the different opposing viewpoints to help bolster their ability to think about finding compelling evidence to support their claims. And then the students were presented topics towards the end of um, the series to choose for their final project. Next slide, please. On the first day of each series, these ground rules are what we cover with the students. And if we notice them not being followed, we remind them of the rules during the opening presentations in the main room in the following weeks, because we wanna ensure that the students are thinking about how to not only be wonderful speakers, but also good listeners. Next slide, please. Uh, so, Danica, this is the slide where I might, if I screen share, I'll, I probably should be able to click on the links. Uh, do I have the power to screen share? Uh, you very much should. So okay. if you're able to see your toolbar, there should be a little icon that is a rectangle with an upward arrow. Okay. Uh, very good. Can, can you see it? Okay, let me see if I can move this out of the way to get the present mode here going. I've got we can move. see. Uh, yeah, but you can also see all the stuff on the side. <laughs> you know what? I'm just going to go for it uh, and click on the website here. Uh, but first, let me talk a little bit before I go to the website um, about um, the uh, resources uh, for the parents and, and the sample we will show you. So um, all the series have focused on controversial topics. Uh, the first series we focused on uh, was Columbus and indigenous people, colonialism, Japanese internment, the media and stereotyping. Our second series focused on the Black Lives Matter movement. Uh, the third series was on the anti-Asian sentiment. And the fourth, which was in the summer, was on climate change and the environment. And now the current series, which we're going to start tomorrow, focuses on marginalized communities. Uh, so the kids will be broken into four groups and they have four topics. So each team will work on a different topic with their, with their instructor. Uh, one is people who are unhoused. Uh, people of various gender identities and sexual orientations, people with a mental health disability, and people with a physical disability. Uh, our program often includes guest speakers. Uh, for example, in spring 2020, we had a docent come speak from the Japanese American Museum uh, about the internment camps. And in fall 2020, we had three panelists come who spoke about their experiences of being Black in the United States and the impact of the Black Lives Matter movement on their lives. That was extremely popular. The kids were completely absorbed and amazed. They got to ask the, the um, speakers questions and um, they got to read their bios in advance, create questions for the speakers. The whole thing was very, very well received by the children. And the speakers all said, we want to come back. So we were, we were pretty excited by uh, the impact that they had um, because they, they were getting that real world experience from the speakers and, and uh, learning things firsthand about their experiences. So that was very popular. Uh, we were very, very intentional about the controversial nature of these topics and we created the website, which is what I'm gonna click on right now. 
Okay, not going to go there because I got to go into present mode. Let me see if I can do that real quick here. Present, present, present. Ah, uh, phooey. <laughs> okay, not going to happen. All that work for nothing. All right, let me see. Oh, wait, new slide. Where? Let me scroll down a second. Give me one quick second. All right, move this down a little bit. It, lo it looks like you can right click on the link. It was showing the link. If you just right click on it. Okay, open link. Thank you. Yeah. You're my hero. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Commissioner. Oh, no, now I got to sign in. You know what? That's too much bother. Um, let me just close that. Um, so, Danica, um, the best laid plans of mice and men have just gone awry here. So uh, I'm going to stop screen sharing and let you take over again. Maybe you right. could, Bridget, put it in when you're done in the chat and we can pull it from there. Yeah, you because you should definitely take a look at it. But quite frankly, I'm kind of relieved because I have to update the uh, website after we're done with the meeting. <laughs> <laughs> So in a sense, that, that kind of uh, saved my um, bacon. So, <laughs> okay, so let's see where were we at. Oh, uh, so we were going to show you the um, uh, week three presentation, uh, which unfortunately we cannot do, uh, but it was quite wonderful. And uh, Tiffany is going to speak to, uh, to you about it. So Tiffany, why don't you uh, talk a little bit about what we did in week three of fall 2020? Um, and I think I can share my screen. So just one moment, because I do. <laughs> okay, we got somebody brave. Oh, I have mine up already. I had mine too, but something happened. Oh, you got it. Awesome. All right. So this is from our week three, um, the Black Lives Matter uh, movement series, where we focused on um, some concepts that we realized during the reflection period, the students didn't necessarily understand what they had learned. So <clears throat> we felt that we needed to give some additional guidance to understand the concepts of racial color blindness. During this class, we took some additional time to define terms and provide connections to real world events. And whenever possible, we like to use personal examples as an opportunity to kind of share what um, we are learning in class. So. In this particular instance, I spoke about why I used the term black instead of African-American to describe myself. And I used my own personal documents to prove the point of how voter ID laws could disenfranchise black people. And it was this grounding that we offered in the program that I believe helped students make sense of how these larger issues affect them. And I'm going to stop sharing so we can go back to the presentation. Thank you for your flexibility, Danica. <laughs> and we should be on slide seven. Yes, next slide, please. So the first series was scheduled to meet for uh, about an hour and a half each time. And Catherine was our sole instructor. And we quickly realized that the students needed more attention. So Catherine was able to quickly recruit and train three instructor assistants who began volunteering in the third week of the series, which elevated the student's learning experience. Um, the popularity after our first series had us have an increase of 16 students join us for the second series, which was the focus on Black Lives Matter, where I showed the example. And eight of those students were from the previous semester and return back for that program. So it does seem that we do have a great return rate when it comes to the information we present. Um, next slide, please. <clears throat> Our number of enrolled students has again increased each semester. However, the summer 2021 August uh, camp was a combination of coding and speech and debate. So the numbers are a little bit more comparable for the coding camps and not necessarily an increase in speech and debate. Um, for the second series, um, the curriculum development and the planning was done by Bridget, Catherine, and myself. And Catherine and the instructional assistants led the breakout rooms to teach the topics and the building blocks of speech and debate. Um, we quickly realized to sustain this program, we needed a core group of volunteers that would need to be recruited and trained. And so we marketed this position to teens um, to volunteer on our website. And we onboarded 10 new volunteers, not only from Notre Dame, but from other high schools as well. 
three instructional assistants returned from that previous semester. And all the recruits were either active in speech or debate in their schools. Um, not all the, excuse me, not all of them were active in speech and debate, but seven had some experience. Um, in the spring 2021 semester, the roles were a little bit more clearly defined. Um, the instructors attended weekly meetings to plan the curriculum and take on the roles of what they would be presenting. And instructional assistants then would come in later in the week for a half hour kind of briefing to ensure they were up to speed and ready to lead their breakout rooms and understood the material. Um, again, our series is designed for third to fifth graders, but starting in fall 2020, we've noticed that a lot of the students are starting to age out. And so we started to envision offering a separate opportunity for middle schoolers. Um, the August camp was a combination of speech and debate and coding. So we were allowed to kind of increase the age range. And we also felt that since the topic was the environment, it was one that works well for a lot of different age groups. And so we were able to invite middle schoolers into that particular group. Um, next slide, please. Um, but we did face some challenges. Um, some of the challenges that we faced um, when we were thinking about our course size was in the spring 2020, we had a larger enrollment than we anticipated. So Catherine had to quickly, of course, recruit and train those volunteers to meet the needs of the class, which of course is always a little chaotic when you're midway through something or, and you have to add more people to help. Um, we also noticed that early on, kids tended to only help those that they knew and so we had to do a lot of icebreakers and small group discussions to really kind of help forge that team relationship. Um, we also had to be very flexible and, week off and meet weekly so we could kind of adjust the curriculum as we saw that issues were arising um, because we were a little ambitious when we first started um, with some of those uh, ways that we were going to teach. And we realized sometimes we need to scale back and other times we need to speed up. Um, during some of the lessons, Bridget had to assist uh, students who were unfamiliar using the iPads when we were um, doing this program in-house. Um, so there were some technology issues that we had to work through. And of course, we had to kind of think about ways to adapt the materials because um, sometimes we suffered a large gap in resuming that course in the online environment. If we hadn't, and we had to make those kind of adjustments to make sure that we could present the same level of quality of program when we transition from in-person to the online environment. Next slide, please. Um, again, in fall 2020, we had hoped to offer a plan for middle schoolers as there was a lot of interest. Um, but of course, you know, we all have our limitations and we needed to consider ways to, you know, kind of generate some more buzz so that we can get some more assistance from our librarians to expand this program to middle schoolers. Um, in the future. And so in spring 2021, again, since Catherine was getting ready to graduate, we did try to recruit and train some more volunteers so we can make sure that this program continued. And we had hoped to be able to try to do a small middle school um, speech and debate program in July of that summer um, of 2021. But unfortunately, um, as students and volunteers often you know don't know their availability until later on in this um, in the summer um, it was necessary to cancel that series but we hope to be able to uh, recruit and maintain a strong level of team volunteers um, and we have been able to do that for the fall 2021 series and the august 2021 series was very successful as it was getting closer to uh, back to school time so a lot of our volunteers who were unable to volunteer in July, we're able to do so in August. So we do believe, of course, that we will be able to continue to maintain this program at the level and the quality that we have. Um, next slide, please. So um, each semester, we survey our parents and our students at the beginning and the end of the semester, uh, because this helps us kind of understand our successes and consider where we need to improve. In spring 2020, we reached out to our in-house expert on assessment for helping with crafting the survey questions. Uh, we tapped into his expertise and uh, starting with the post surveys for spring 2020. And he recommended that we keep the parents' surveys with open-ended questions, which we did, uh, and use Likert scales for the students. Uh, then, and what we discovered was that the number one expectation from parents, uh, hands down, was that they wanted to see their child's confidence increase. 
uh, and their ability to speak and interact with people. Uh, and then their second most important um, uh, uh, expectation was that they learn some debate skills. Um, then after that, the, the numbers dropped in, in their expectations until uh, to about 10 for critical, a lot, about 10 of them mentioned critical thinking. And then after that, current events. A handful of parents uh, wanted their children to improve their social skills, uh, work collaboratively and make friends. Uh, parental expectations overall for the past five semesters now uh, seem to be fairly consistent uh, from semester to semester. Uh, the current group of parents, I just looked at all their surveys. Um, they again list confidence as the number one thing they're looking for us uh, building in their children and number two being speech and debate. So it doesn't seem to change that that's definitely our marketing seems to be in alignment with what they want and, and the way we present our goals and student objectives. Um, clearly, that's exactly what they're looking for. Uh, also, some parents did this semester say they were thankful for the focus on social justice issues and on marginalized groups. Um, and so we were pleased to hear that as well. Next slide, please. So this is some of the discoveries we made in the post-program surveys from the parents. Uh, parental expectations overall were indeed met or exceeded. Uh, we get ongoing praise for the teachers themselves, which are all teens, uh, and for the course, um, how it's designed. Uh, we are happy uh, to report that the parents um, uh, that uh, they, they agreed that what we, uh, we taught was what they were looking for. Uh, we continue to look to the parents to find out what, how we want to plan future programs. So we really look at those um, um, surveys very closely to see if we, we are in, in alignment. Uh, for example, we spent some time um, for this next semester, the one that starts tomorrow, we really looked at it and said, you know what? Um, they want more, 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 more speech and debate. So started finding more games that really um, spark critical thinking, pro and con, uh, things that will really work them uh, thinking in those lines. So added that, also added a component, um, deliberate component of persuasive speech uh, using my theater background uh, as, as to help teach that as well. Uh, and uh, so those are some things that we've learned as we look at those surveys that we definitely need to beef up and that's what we're doing. Uh, and then we've also are added a few videos that demonstrate these skills, some of the pros doing it. Next slide, please. So for the student pre-survey, uh, we only asked the kids two questions, and one was about the uh, use of library resources. We wanted to see if they actually knew how to use them. Uh, and the other was about their confidence in public speaking, because we saw that that's what the parents were looking for. Uh, and the results pretty much varied from semester to semester, but the most consistent data we got was on the question about the public speaking. Uh, and we are happy to report that every single semester, uh, when we look at the pre and the post survey results from, from the kids, there is always a perceived increase on their, uh, they perceive that they have definitely improved in their confidence levels. So they are, they are reporting that, that um, they are improving. And, uh, but of course, you know, at, at, it's also hard to get the surveys because it, they don't have to turn them in. We just have to ask them to turn them in. So the numbers are always inconsistent, but we try. Uh, we tell them it's really important to turn these in because this is how we improve our program. So please take this moment to do it. And, uh, so we try. <laughs> Next slide, please. And of course, every semester we receive uh, thankful emails from parents reporting their satisfaction with the series and kind of praising the work that we've done. Um, as you can see here in this particular uh, example, um, one of our parents um, felt that her daughters had grown tremendously due to their participation in speech and debate. Um, I'm going to give you a moment so you can read it yourself. Next slide, please. Um, this is another uh, example of some of the emails that we've received from parents. Um, and this one really uh, warmed our hearts. Um, in fact, this parent was um, very overwhelmed by the actions her son took and decided to take it upon herself to email the principal of Notre Dame to sing Catherine's praises. Um, and this is a portion of what she sent. Uh, my son, my eight-year-old son just finished the San Jose Public Library speech and debate class taught by Catherine Tong. And wow, what an impressive young woman she is. I overheard many of their Zoom calls and was consistently amazed at Catherine's poise, 
her ability to make kids feel at ease and encourage their participation. I know many grown-ups who aren't as good at leading a discussion. It was truly a blessing and an honor to have her touch our lives. My son, who to be honest is a curmudgeon for a third grader, is generally sad that the class is over and I'm 100% sure that's all because of Catherine. Additionally, this mom realized, relayed a story about an incident that occurred at the dinner table. Um, she stated that she mentioned that she was presenting to the mayor of San Jose, and she was impressed at how well he conducted the meeting, giving everyone a fair chance to speak. And her son burst out, just like Catherine. And it took her a minute to realize her son was connecting the experience of speech and debate under Catherine's leadership and her equitable treatment of students and how, to how the mayor conducts his meetings. And we were all overwhelmed by seeing how our program had helped this young man equate his experiences um, as a participant in the program to the real world and the political arena that his mother was in. Next slide, please. Although spring 2021 was the most challenging for our instructors and for our students alike, uh, surprisingly enough, students were far more vocal about expressing their love for the course than they were in previous semesters on the survey. Uh, we were very surprised by this because it, it was indeed a, a very heavy, uh, it was the anti-Asian sentiment um, program. And uh, of course, things were really heating up uh, throughout the United States. And uh, so it was, a, it was tough for all of us to get through that, including the children. Uh, but uh, yet the kids really wrote more than they ever wrote um, about how much they enjoyed the course. So we were, we were very, very pleased because we worked very hard on that semester. Okay, next slide, please. So we've always been determined to ensure a quality program for the students. And to achieve this, we've included measurable outcomes tied directly to the student learning objectives and to the questions on the pre and post surveys. Uh, we also state the learning objectives clearly in the marketing of the program. In regard to curriculum, the topic itself and the reading levels of the material, as well as the basics of speech and debate taught, uh, we've discovered definitely need to be aligned with the target audience. Third to fifth graders are not ready to learn uh, formal speech and debate. Uh, instead, we, as stated before, we teach them the building blocks of debate with short debates requiring the use of evidence and would you rather exercises as well as pro and con games. Uh, as far as transparency goes in communication, uh, it needs to occur between all parties, the volunteers, the parents, the students, and library administration. This includes determining and establishing a designated means of communication with volunteers and having all the expectations clearly outlined. Additional transparency uh, of the course topics and requirements need to be clearly stated to the parents and the students. And lastly, the time has to be factored into schedules for the planning of the series for any adjustments that need to be made along the way. Uh, when planning a series with a new focus or topic, it is necessary to build in time for a weekly planning meeting with the volunteers. Uh, for example, in spring 2021, we met three times a week, first with the instructors, two days later with the instructors, and then finally with the instructor assistants uh, for the actual class itself. Uh, Additionally, after each class, we met with the instructors and the assistants for a half an hour to make sure that we could debrief and discuss any problems that they encountered and discuss solutions. Um, of course, for series with repeat topics where we continue and repeat a different course, uh, a lot less time will be needed in planning. Uh, but we basically built set five different programs and now we're gonna be able to reap the benefits of that and start recycling them and just adding new articles. So we're very excited that we've reached that point. Okay, next slide, please. Um, so as Bridget mentioned, um, we did realize after we did the environmental justice uh, program in August that a lot of the uh, information that we presented is repeatable. Um, and we anticipate being able to do that in the future. Even though science and technology, of course, will change as well as the planet, um, the presentation could be used again. Um, we just have to change the articles um, that were being read. But we do want to reinforce that there are certain things that will always be covered during our program in every series. And some of these are, one, the notion that history repeats itself, um, that Many of the things that we see, of course, um, happen over and over again um, in our political history. Um, two, the power and influence of the media um, and how historically, you know, that might have been posters and propaganda, um, but now it might be othering and 
things that see, people see on social media and in the news. Um, the importance of identifying credible resources, such as using vetted databases, um, realizing that there are two sides to every argument, pro and con, and that in order to have a strong argument, you need to understand both opposing viewpoints. And then finally, addressing social justice issues requires examining racial equity and intersectionality and considering how we can be inclusive to all groups when we start addressing various forms and manifestations of discrimination. And so we are very excited about this program and its continuing future. And the volunteers that we've recruited in spring 2021 are mostly freshmen and sophomores. So this will also help to kind of sustain the program for the next few years, as they've all expressed an interest of continuing on as they matriculate through high school and then go on to graduation. And additionally, our new fall recruits that we have added to our volunteers um, plan to also remain active in our program. Um, last slide, please. So this concludes our presentation and I, we appreciate your time on today. Um, I know it's late. Um, so is there any questions that we can answer for you? So uh, before we get to commissioners, are there any um public comments down. Anybody who has a public comment who's here from the public can raise their hand and we're happy to set the timer. Seeing no hands, let's move to commissioners. Commissioner Kelly. Yes, I, I just want to say this is what, something I'm really, really interested in. I, I've been a speech and debate judge for years. Oh. I graduated from Cal with a major in uh, speech and English. I've been a judge for mock trials, I've been a judge for rotary speech contests, been a judge in the constitution program. Uh, and what is accomplished in those things is really dynamite. And uh, your program as you've developed it is the best I've seen. And I've seen a lot of them. Uh, I also graduated from Lowell High School, which is one of the champions of speech and debate in the United States for high school level. So my question for you besides just saying, wow, is uh, what can we do as commissioners to help with this program and to promote it? Wow, that's a great question. Um, Tiffany, you have any thoughts? Well, as always, we are always looking for great volunteers who have a background in speech and debate. So if you know anyone who would be interested, or if you know some really enthusiastic high school students, we really want their participation because, again, I feel like that for that particular age group with the younger children, them working with students who are slightly older than really motivates them to really be interested in the topics um, because they get to see, okay, in the future, this could be me doing this and leading a speech and debate and teaching these skills. Um, to other students. And so I really feel like not only are they re more relatable than having a, you know, a bunch of adults trying to teach them this, but it also gives them an opportunity to not only, you know, get a chance to kind of talk things out in a more form less formalized kind of way because they're talking with other students and other kids like themselves, but it also gives them a chance to see what the future, what high school could be like for them. So that is one thing that we could consider as a, a, a big ask, of course. Well, that, that's not so much what I was asking. Uh, I'm speaking as a commissioner, but I would be more than happy to work as an advisor as a regular person. So that would be phenomenal. I, I'm in the uh, process of finding a lot of articles and videos right now. And every semester it's a challenge because they don't write things for third to fifth graders on these topics because they don't think they should learn it yet. And so I end up really spending hours and hours trying to find things and usually have to change the language of an article I have found so that it is understood by a third to fifth grader. And that's a lot of work, which is why we're trying to create a sustainable program of things that we've already created. And Tiffany and I are kind of hoping for this miracle to happen that we're going to end up presenting at uh, the American Library Association in DC. We put in a proposal and that we will excite the entire nation of librarians to want to contribute to a repository so we can all pull from it. Uh, that would be our dream, that we would have everyone putting in PowerPoints and articles and things that were right for this age group and we could all share it. Uh, to me, that would be wonderful and a great way for me to retire. 
knowing that <laughs> I, I had a I had a part in that uh, before uh, before I leave. That that would be my dream because it's it's really been as as Tiffany said, it's heartwarming. Some of the things that parents have written, I, I, we've cried. Uh, we were so thrilled with with the change that they saw in their children, and that we were a part of that. It's it's more than we could ask for as librarians to know that we're making a positive difference. So thank, thank you. you so much. And we will call on you, Ken. Uh, I'm, I'm sure that I can find your email address somewhere. <laughs> Danica can certainly help with that. Thank you, Commissioner. Okay. <laughs> Commissioner Zisser. Yeah, I mean, another amazing presentation, um, amazing stuff you guys are doing. Um, I have sort of a, a question I, I'm, I'll probably be asking every time I hear about these things. Obviously, the subject matter um, I find really compelling. It um, promotes, I imagine it promotes uh, diverse interest from the community and in, in participating in the program. Um, I have two questions. One is, do you have any, you know, information about the demographics of participants? Um, and then my second question is um, whether um, you you experienced any pushback or challenge to the subject matter you were proposing. Um, and then depending on your answers, I may have follow-up questions, um, <laughs> but I, uh, I applaud you for doing it. <laughs> And, and using topics that are seen by some as controversial, um, but shouldn't be, um, and, uh, and tackling, including with young, young children. I think that's um, really impressive. So thank you for doing it. Um, and I, I echo Ken in um, offering any way I can be supportive. Um, I'm not a speech and debater, but I'm a lawyer, so I guess I am a speech and debater. Yes, you are. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, I'm topically, uh, I'm particularly interested um, as someone who works on uh, police reform and, and, uh, and those issues. So anyway, demographics and yeah, pushback. I, yeah. So Tiffany, you want to take the demographics one or do you want me to take it? I was ready for demographics. I thought um, you were. <laughs> So um, when we were starting and thinking about um, the information that we were collecting from our participants, um, part of the things that I wanted to do, um, especially as when we were adding the coding component, was to bake that into our registration process. Um, so what I had um, parents do is when they registered their students, they provided us with the information of their zip code of where they lived, um, their racial background, um, and I used a uh, different kind of way to approach the uh, racial demographics um, in that I looked at our population of San Jose and broke it down and made sure that each one of those groups was represented in part of that registration process. So I could accurately uh, pull that information because I didn't want just to get a generalized, I see myself as Asian, I see myself as um, just, you know, a black, I wanted to make sure that I was digging down into those racial demographics because um, just using, of course, just the generalization of Asian, that can mean a bunch of different things to a bunch of different individual groups. And I wanted to make sure that I was not um, stack loading too many of the same types of children because I wanted to make sure that we had diverse opinions as part of this. Um, so that was part of the elements of the children who were selected into that particular program. Um, additionally, we also asked uh, gender information. And so we wanted to make sure that we kind of had an even balance of boys and girls in the room. Um, so these were all kind of the elements that were baked into our August 2021 um, program to ensure that we were providing a program that was equitable, that had diverse voices in the room and gave an opportunity from kids, for kids from all over the city to have a chance to join the program. Um, so that was kind of the way we approached getting that demographic information. So specific, yeah. So specifically, that's awesome. Um, that, but specifically, and if you don't have the numbers, that's okay. But are you able to comment on sort of how did that break? Did, did it end up being a very diverse group of kids? And then I, I, I'm interested. You just mentioned something that up that sort of sparked another question, which is 
um, it sounds like you got more applicants or interested people than you were able to to en enroll. Is that is that right? That's yeah. usually the case with a lot of programs. Um, we try to make sure that we um, accepted right. as many students as we could, of course. Um, there were, also, of course, some students who were really aged out of the uh, target age group because we also asked their grade information. And there was a few on individuals where I'm just like, you're a high schooler, so not quite. <laughs> but um, or they were a little bit too young on the spectrum. Um, but we really wanted to make sure that we uh, try to get a large number of individuals. Um, the vast majority of our students, um, as when it broke down, um, we had a larger number of third um, and fourth graders. Um, a few fifth graders, and then the rest were all middle schoolers. Um, and so we had uh, originally 69 participants registered um, in that um, in those particular uh, grade groups um, total. And um, again, like I said, the vast majority were in the elementary school age. And then um, we had, of course, uh, about 11 middle schoolers. Um, when it came down to the breakdown of uh, girls and boys. Um, we skewed a little bit heavier this go round to girls when I started looking at the numbers. Um, and that always makes me super excited because it was also a coding component too, because they took their final presentations and then either built an app as a solution or a website to further present that information that they could share with friends and family. Um, so I was excited, of course, to see a larger number of uh, girl participants because that is always an issue of course when you start adding into coding um when it kind of looking at the racial demographics um for our particular program we skewed a little bit heavier um with asian students uh as the identifying factor but i made sure that when we were doing our registrations and i was looking at who was going to ensure to get a spot um i moved up uh students who were in zip codes that were in certain areas of the cities like East San Jose. And I moved up students who we didn't particularly always see show up at programs, which were um, our black and Hispanic students as they're often um, not participating in some of the online programs. And so I wanted to make sure that they had a spot as well so they could talk about some of the things that they were experiencing and learning. And they also added that diversity of uh, experience into the rooms as they work together. So I'm going to, um, if you don't mind, Commissioner, I did you get your last question answered? I know the others were through the chair, but I wanted to make sure that you got the second question. And then if not, I think we need to keep moving on now. But did you get the first second question answered? Um, I think it was second question was pushback. Yeah, right. pushback. that was the one. Um, we can answer that very quickly. Uh, surprisingly enough, We've had very, very little pushback. Um, I think it's partly because we market it very clearly as to what we're covering and parents can just opt not to choose it if they don't want to go that route. Uh, and so um, I was expecting some this time around. This is the first time we're dealing with gender identity and sexual orientation is one of the topics. And uh, so far I had one question about it, asking about if it's in line with Catholic guidelines. And <laughs> <laughs> and I said, I, I've done a lot of research on this and I'm confident in what we're presenting is uh, age appropriate. According to the psychologists out there, I looked at a lot of websites from, uh, from the psychologists and, and that parent was fine with it and said they don't want to remove their child. They want them to, to, to have this experience because they've heard such good things about the program. So we will, Tiffany and I will be monitoring all the rooms closely um, and making sure, and plus uh, the PowerPoints are created by myself and pulling the articles. Uh, so I tell my teachers to uh, stick to the script, don't go off the rails. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, so between all that, I guess it falls on Tiffany and myself if anything would happen because we, we're very careful about what we cover. So I hope that answers your question. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Bridget. And um, Tiffany, I, anybody else? Going once, going twice. Ah, Commissioner Thorson. Um, I just wanted to echo what everyone was saying about what a great presentation and program this is. Um, I work at Stanford Libraries and we have a um, social equity librarian and she's been working on a systemic racism database, which came to mind when you mentioned um, the repository for presentations. Oh. And 
Um, so if you're interested, I can put you in touch with her because she may have some great resources or connections that could you could share. Thank you. That sounds wonderful. Okay, great. Thank you, Commissioner. Any other commissioners? All right. I only have just two quick things, of course, to uh, echo. Um, spectacular. It's always amazing every time when we hear our presentations of the body of work that this library system does. Um, so one of my questions is, and maybe you said it, but you, when you were talking about high school volunteers, do they count towards their 40 hours that are required for high school graduation? Yes. Perfect. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. We, uh, we always encourage them to put all their hours in. They get hours for the meetings beforehand yes, and for actual right. presentations. Excellent. That is perfect. And then I, although not like Commissioner Kelly, uh, however, was a speech and debate high schooler uh, for the Lions Club and Girl State and all that good stuff for years. And my first speech was television, master or servant. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> a long time ago. Um, I like so that. I may steal that one. Master, <laughs> okay. So I'm, I'm looking for pros and cons. So. There you go. Um, so wonderful. I'm, I'm, we're so lucky to have uh, have you both championing this kind of work for our kiddos. So thank you. We really thank appreciate you. you. All right. We're moving on. We're now at Council Liaison for Council Member Aranas. Maria, Maria, or yes, you are here. Ah, I see you. Hi, uh, good evening. I am uh, Mariella, Council Assistant with Councilwoman Silvia Arenas' office, and I have three announcements tonight. Um, the first is an update on Fall Family Festival. So uh, unfortunately, Fall Family Festival has been canceled due to weather. It was originally scheduled for this Sunday, October 24th, which I announced last month, uh, but the family-friendly event at Lake Cunningham has been canceled. And so it will be postponed to sometime in the next year. We are super bummed about it, um, but wanna provide the best experience that we can to our families. And that's probably not in the pouring rain. And so uh, there are more details to come on that postponement. And uh, second, I wanted to extend an invitation to an upcoming joint meeting. Uh, so on behalf of council members Arenas and Perales, we would like to invite you to join us for a, a joint special meeting uh, between the city and the county. So uh, this one is actually on gender-based violence and child sexual abuse. It will be held on Friday, November 5th from 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. on Zoom. So please save the date and I will be sure to email you the agenda details in the week prior to the meeting. Uh, and separately from that, the second part to the joint meeting on child well-being will be scheduled sometime in the next few weeks. So please stay tuned for that announcement as well. Um, and lastly, uh, it, uh, my last announcement is around uh, COVID-19 child vaccinations. So uh, many of you probably already know that the COVID-19 vaccine for children ages 5 to 11 is currently pending uh, U.S. Food and Drug Administration authorization, uh, and that that authorization is expected within the next couple of weeks. And so I know that the city of San Jose and the county of Santa Clara have already started working really closely with uh, school districts and school sites in anticipation participation of that authorization to ensure a quick rollout of vaccination clinics, um, especially in our hardest hit communities in San Jose. And so I just wanted to encourage you all to find out if your child's school has a plan in place to vaccinate on site. Um, and also to start having conversations with the children in your lives about getting vaccinated, about why it's safe and why it's important, uh, because ensuring that children in our lives are vaccinated as soon as that authorization is given means that they will be fully vaccinated uh, by the December holidays, right, with both doses and a couple of weeks under their belt. And so I know that that's going to be a huge relief and joy to many families. And so, yeah, that is all for me tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Mariella. I'm very sad about the fall festival. We were going to go, but um, next year. Let's see. So we're moving on to chair announcements. I have three um, working backwards. This week, we on Monday uh, broke uh, ribbon cutting, did our ribbon cutting for the Shirakawa FRC and our Bridge Library. Uh, Jill was, you know, of course, our wonderful speaker on our partnership with the Franklin McKinley School District, Catholic Charities, um, the library, First Five, um, and many, oh, um, 
but council member Maya Sparza is that's her district. And so everyone was there uh, in, um, there was a great event that had farm animals from Happy Hollow, Potter the Otter, our dinosaur too, Dan. And uh, it was just really lovely. And I have to tell you that Bridge Library in uh, Shirakawa FRC is spectacular. Uh, it was gorgeous. And so uh, we did ribbon cutting and I was super happy to attend. The another announcement is we did a um, joint meeting that was um, put together by Council Member Aranas and uh, Supervisor Chavez between the city and the county on child wellness in the city and county and looking at uh, what the two um, entities, the city full council could show and the um, county senior and families commission with also vice chair Susan Ellenberg looking at all of the things that we could possibly do to support children in our city and therefore support economic recovery for staff and people with little kids in their lives as well. Uh, Araceli Delgado was a representation for our family friend and neighbor program. Um, I was a kind of multi-level uh, presenter, but also on workforce development in the early care and education and in universal transitional kindergarten. And it was pretty spectacular with some ongoing steps looking at how do we access the American Recovery Act funds to support uh, not only our kiddos, but our families that need childcare to go back to work. And finally, First Five is releasing um, a set of um, series of promotions and PSAs around supporting the zero to five kiddos, especially going into the holidays who cannot get vaccinated and the ways to do it by masking, of course, getting vaccinated and washing your hands as you're around babies and little guys that are not able to get vaccinated and how folks can protect our littlest uh, community members. So those are my announcements. The library director announcement. I know Jill is off on a special birthday assignment. And so I believe Michelle is going to give the library director's announcements. Good evening, everybody. Um, to um, go off of what um, our chair has mentioned and shared with us about the opening of the Shirakawa um, Bridge Library, I just want to let you know that that collection includes over 350 books in English, Spanish, and Vietnamese targeting children ages zero to five. And in addition to the collection, library staff will be hosting weekly programs and sharing library resources with the community. So we're really excited about this partnership. Um, we have some really great um, news. We are in increasing our number of hotspots with our SJ Access program. Thanks to the unanimous support from city council during the August 31st council meeting, they approved our at and hotspot expansion plan. And um, this is going to be, allow us to continue to address our digital access needs for our residents and our students. Thanks to their support, we're adding 1,200 high-speed AT&T hotspots to our collection this week for the public to check out. And those are available, um, all that information at sjpl.org forward slash hotspot. Additionally, um, we are launching our next AmeriCorps Vista recruitment um, our SJPL VISTAs support critical library programs through fundraising, grant writing, research, program development, and volunteer recruitment. AmeriCorps members in the VISTA program serve for a calendar year and gain valuable work experience while also receiving a living stipend and an education award at the end of their service year. We are currently recruiting library VISTAs to support expanded learning, partners in reading, digital equity and inclusion, and SJPL works units. And for those details, you can visit sjpl.org forward slash Vista. And lastly, Halloween celebrations. So starting on Monday, October 25th through Saturday, October 30th, SJPL will host a spectacular book giveaway at all library locations for kids and teens to stop by and pick up, pick out two free books. And those are available while supplies last. We're so pleased also to announce that our Halloween Storytime Parade is back at King this year. It will be held on Friday, October 29th from 4 to 5 p.m. This event will feature a spooky outdoor story time and a trick-or-treat parade through the first floor of the King Library and costumes are welcomed and encouraged. And lastly, on Saturday, October 30th from 2 p.m. to 5 p.m., 
Allen Rock and Hillview branches will host a trunk or treat featuring lowriders, community and health resources, books, and more. This event is hosted in partnership with the United Lowrider Council of San Jose, Community Health Partnership, Indian Health Center, Kaiser Permanente, and AACI. And those are the updates. Thank you, Michelle. Okay, we have no youth commissioner presenting this evening. So I'm gonna open up the floor for any announcements from commissioners. So if any commissioner would like to make an announcement, please uh, hit your raise hand button and I'll call on you. Commissioner Kelly. Yes, thank you. Uh, based on a conversation that I had earlier at uh, the orientation meeting, I was asking about the opening of the friends groups. And I'm happy to announce that the friends groups are now available to work in the libraries. And I'm a, a founding friend of the Bascom Library. And we have already started uh, putting our books out and sorting everything up from the problems that we had for the last year and a half. So good for good for the friends groups. Great. Great news. Thank you, Commissioner. Any other commissioners that have announcements? Once, twice, sold. Thank you all. Now, if we're moving on to Commissioner Thorson, who's going to provide an update on the Public Library Foundation work and board. Thank you. So, I have a few um, updates. Um, the foundation approved awards of 1.1 million for um, San Jose Learns, and that's the uh, grants that are used to support after school programs for TK through third grade students who are struggling in low income schools. And um, the 1.1 million will support 1,000, approximately 1,035 students, as well as summer programming for 210 students. I um, also wanted to mention that um, all 50 Resilience Corps associates um, have been hired and they are working uh, part-time after school at five community-based organizations, including the library and Parks and Rec, and they're helping K through 12 students who are struggling academically. And um, right now the foundation is looking at synergies between this program and other SJPLF funded programs like uh, Coding 5K. Um, also the San Jose Aspires program uh, which we heard about at our last um, commission in September, which gives micro grants for preparing high school students for post-secondary um, experiences. Um, that program has expanded to enroll all ninth graders at William Overfelt High School who will be first generation college students and ninth and 10th graders at San Jose High School who will be first generation college students. So that means that um, the total number of students from low income families who are enrolled in SG Aspires is nearly 1200. Um, and that's between ninth and 11th grade. So that's really great news that the program continues to expand. And then um, finally, um, the foundation takes part in the um, advocacy subcommittee that also includes members of um, the commission and friends of the libraries and um, wants to encourage commissioners to begin to reach out to all of your contacts, um, be they council members, people you know who love supporting the libraries ahead of the budget process to remind them of all the awesome and amazing work that the library has been doing because we need to um, restore the library funding for this coming year. And we'd also like to advocate for pushing uh, for Sunday hours as well. Um, so just keep that in mind as you're talking to people about all the great work the library's doing. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Absolutely wonderful. Okay, moving on, it, were any commissioners or staff that wanna share any other upcoming events or opportunities for um, folks to attend? If you do, raise your hand and I'll call on you. All right, seeing none, we're moving on. So I'm getting ready to have, if there's any um, folks that want to add future agenda items that are not covered in our work plan uh, for the November 17th, 2021 meeting, uh, we could talk about it now. So if you have 
an agenda item that you'd like to add, raise your hand and I'll call on you. Commissioner Kelly. Yes, thank you, appreciate that. <clears throat> I would like to have a discussion about arranging for the general public to be able to offer books to the library for the collections. I know that there's a program that exists now, but you know, I hate to say it's not really interactive with the general public. So I'd like to, uh, I'd like to recommend that we have someone from the library talk to us about how we can or cannot arrange for either small donations of books that people are interested in adding to the library and is not there, or for major groups to donate books at the request of the library system. Uh, you're asking about my personal experience. I went through the process, um, recommended a book for purchase by the library, never heard back from anybody. So I also went to one of the librarians and asked the same question, asked if they would uh, forward it, that same question to the powers that be and haven't heard anything since. So I'd like us to see, I'd like us to be responsive to questions like that that come uh, from the general public. It also applies to people who have asked questions about why isn't your uh, library containing this kind of book, quote unquote. And I don't have an answer for that. So that's that's my suggestion. Michelle, are you will you capture that and Danica for Jill for our next planning? Um, yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Thank yeah, you, Commissioner. Mm -hmm. um, Chair, I would just just make a note to set expectations that our meeting next month is um, fairly impacted because that is our, our triple meeting month. But I will offer that we are absolutely open to talking about this at a future meeting when it makes sense for the agenda. I'm not sure that it makes sense next month, um, especially to provide the information that you're looking for. But we absolutely will take it back. Great, Commissioner Kelly. Yeah, I, I agree. Thank you very much for that input. It's not it's not something critical. It's just something I think that we need to talk about. Thank you. Thank you, Anne. Any other um, additions or and to note, thank you, Anne, that uh, November is going to be a big one. So we would think about other times for any topics. All right, moving on, we're going to get ready to adjourn. Uh, it is, oh, let me find the time, because you know, that's a job. Okay, it is 821, and I think we're adjourned. Thank you, everybody. Have a good week. Thank you, everyone. You all, bye. bye. Thanks, folks. Good job, team. Hello. <laughs> <sighs>